Hey, hello everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our four o'clock session or whatever time you're at. Maybe you're in a different time zone. It's four o'clock for me. I'm in Orlando at UCF. My name is Amy Denoyles and I'm an instructional designer at Center for Distributed Learning and I'm going to be moderating a student panel. So we have four amazing students who have joined us. These students have not just benefited from open educational resources and open education, but they've had an active stance in promoting open education and advocating for it on our campus. So we're really excited that they're joining us. We, we wanna get into a great conversation. I'm gonna introduce them in just a minute, but I did want to uh, encourage the, the participants and the, the people that are watching the session. We would love to hear some of your thoughts, stories, questions for the panel as we're going. So if you happen to have a question in your mind, feel free to use the, the chat or raise your hand if you would like to ask a, a question. So we'll, we'll kind of, you know, we'll see how the questions go. We might ask a few in the middle. We might, we'll have some time at the end if you have some questions at the end, but we definitely wanna make this conversation worthwhile for everyone in attendance. So feel free to use the text chat. I'm a huge fan of the back channel. All right, so let's introduce now our four students in the panel. First, is Lucy Blanco. She is a sophomore majoring in undergraduate studies, uh, aspiring to attend law school post-graduation. She currently serves as the academic affairs coordinator on the executive branch of UCF student government. She serves as a liaison between the student body and UCF administration, advocating for initiatives and projects that have an impact on students and reflect what's important to them. Next, we have Joshua Ashby. He's been a member of this group called the Wiki Knights. You're going to hear a lot more about this group called the Wiki Knights since 2021. He's currently a fourth year physics major and is the current president of Wiki Knights. He's continued to advocate for OER and raise awareness about OER alternatives among both students and faculty. He'll be graduating this semester, congratulations, and will be continuing his education to earn a graduate physics degree and is interested in computational physics research. Our third participant is Carson Cox. He's a second year computer science major and vice president of the Wiki Knights group. He's a huge OER advocate and part-time OER contributor. He's graduating in fall 2026 with a hope to pursue a career in cybersecurity. And finally, we have Jarrett Longworth, has been a member of Wiki Knights since 2020 and has spearheaded projects such as creating OER for computer science curriculum and reaching out to students and faculty alike to bridge conversations about open education. He was in Wiki Knights leadership during 2021 to 2023 and is now working on his master's in computer science at UCF. His current goals are to continue to learn and for, to further education, interested in uh, processor design and computer architecture. <sighs> okay, that was a mouthful. So let, let's just say we, we need to know, we need to pick these students' brains to understand how do they understand open ed? Why is it so important to them? Why have they taken this on as part of their uh, work uh, in their university life and beyond? And uh, hopefully we'll be able to gleam a couple, uh, couple of great insights and maybe walk back to our own institutions with some thoughts and advice about how to spearhead and continue to improve open education at all the universities and, and beyond. All right, so let's start with our first question. Uh, so let's, let's start really general. And uh, how about telling us about the financial challenges that college students are facing in 2024? Lucy, how about you start? Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. Um, so excited to be here with all you guys. I mean, coming into my position within student government, like she stated before, I really have the privilege of getting to work with a lot of students, um, survey them, and really just get a good grasp on what our student population is looking like. And in a recent um, study, it UCF came back saying that 81% of our students utilize financial aid. So these are students who are utilizing some sort of financial aid 
in a various amount of facets and ways. And meanwhile, the cost of a college degree in recent years has gone up more than a thousand percent. So, you know, when talking about how we can alleviate some of these financial pressures off of students, this is why it's so important to advocate for affordable instructional materials um, like OER. Um, and honestly, I think that in my work in advocating for things like this, talking to students on how much it means to them to have this as a, you know, an option, it's just so important to have that option for them. Um, it's, you know, it's quite incredible to see like the difference that it truly makes on student lives and how much money we're saving them. That's right. Uh, how, do, does someone else have an, uh, an idea about uh, different kinds of challenges? I know there's not just one financial challenge that students face, there's multiple. So are there certain kind of categories that are especially challenging in this year? Um, I mean, if I could just uh, jump in real quick. Uh, I wouldn't know about this year in particular, but generally <laughs> Wikinites talked, well, I mean, obviously inflation is hurting all of us, but when Wikinites have talked to students, you know, even this past semester, right, we always hear like food, you know, rent and gas, because we usually what we'll ask is we'll ask, you know, if you uh, had an open textbook and you didn't really have to spend this much money, what would you have spent it on? And of course, those are the three most common answers. So it's not just, you know, frivolous things. These are like things that are really important to students, you know, surviving, you know, it's that base like level on, on like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and all that. <laughs> That's right. We ran a similar uh, survey to students that have used OER. We have a survey now that's a around 10,000 student responses. And, and we asked a very similar question. How would you spend the saved money if you weren't spending it on course materials? And the number one, re one was food. That was the first one. It was food, housing, which we know is very expensive around here, especially education, and then transportation. So these are these four huge categories that a lot of people are struggling with, but college students uh, especially. So certainly adding course materials to all of that is not helping. Anything that we can do to lighten the load for students in order to get better access to education, that, that is what we're, that is what our goal is. All right, how about, let's take a step back this whole uh, conference is about open education. Uh, how about Jarrett, how would you define open education? If you had, you know, a, a, a minute elevator pitch, how would you describe it to someone who didn't know anything about it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and thank you for having us. I think this is really awesome. Um, I think um, open education is really just the ability to access information readily available, um, the same way that uh, you know you might go on Wikipedia and you know search for something you're interested in. Um, I think that's really the same thing, but in uh, in like an educational sense, you know, you can find your books or your resources. Um, I, I think that's really all it boils down to. Does, does anyone else have a a a, a caveat or or an addition to? that conception of open education? Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in. I think that's a great way to put it in very simple terms. And I think it's also important to know that OER can look so different. Um, and that's what's so special about it is it's so adaptable to whatever you're learning. And in my experience talking with, you know, other professors, it's, it's quite incredible to see like, work that they've written themselves and being able to um, translate that into open educational resources and being able to share it, not just within their class at their university, but actually making it accessible to a whole slew of universities and being able to impact like all these students that may not even be within our own community. So that's something that's really special. And, you know, they can, I, we were, we were at the, um, aim high awards and they were talking with the biology professors and i thought that was so fascinating to learn about you know the kind of open educational resources um that look in their like how they look in their class compared to an english professor right um and it ultimately i think benefits the students because it's able to streamline our learning and diversify it a little bit like i know i learned so much better when you know i have uh, lots of modes of i guess ways of retaining that information too <laughs> Definitely. That kind of ties to now the, the benefits that students have experienced. Lucy, you just mentioned one uh, about it being more streamlined. Um, but can somebody tell us about 
your best experience related to a course where the instructor used open educational resources, materials, or, or maybe some other kind of open approach? Maybe Joshua? Sure, I'd love to. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, one of my first experiences, at least uh, when it comes to UCF and experiencing open education, uh, was in my own major. It was in the physics department. Uh, physics one and two with calculus mm. I had with uh, Dr. Reyes. And um, what was really nice about that wasn't just the fact that, oh, I don't have to worry about a paid textbook. Um, but one of the advantages about open educational resources is that uh, instructors are really, really able to implement that into the courses the way they want to. And so what would happen is there'd be a chapter on say like electrostatics or something. And it'd be like, for physics too, right? And it'd be like, oh, here's a link uh, to the OpenStax book of exactly where you can use it. But of course, you know, as we know, uh, hopefully with OpenStax, they also have, you know, if you prefer a physical copy, that's something you can have. And so of course it was the just, oh, wow, I don't have to, you know, worry about a textbook uh, like price. And, you know, that's obviously something that's very big to students, but it's also something for professors where professors and faculty have the option to adapt it the way they want. And then also, and, and I know I'm going on for a little bit, so I'll just end on That's this fine. note. Uh, there's also perpetual access, right? If I want to go back for whatever reason, if I'm like, oh man, I'm forgetting something about electrostatics, I can do that. And that is like what, going back to what Jarrett said about the open access and just being able to access it whenever you need. That is just so pertinent and important as well. Right. That yes, that that is so true. I I know that with, for instance, in an open stacks book or any other other kind of open resource, there have been teachers that have been. Uh, one of the concerns is that students are coming into a course without some kind of background, the prior knowledge. There's some prior knowledge that's missing, and it's so nice now. You don't have to require them to purchase something more to help remediate. Now you can simply say, if you do need additional, if you need more background about a particular concept, and like you said, link to maybe an intro book that through OpenStack. So it's it's been really helpful and really opened the doors for a lot of people. Uh, does anyone else have kind of a success story of a of a course that they experienced where a teacher used uh, some kind of open resources? Uh, I think I can chime in here. Um, uh, one of the uh, open educational resources that I know I have used personally, I know that many of my my personal friends have used, is actually um, a resource that was created by Wikinights, which is uh, the club I'm the vice president of. Um, before I was even in the club. Um, I was in this um, intro to C programming course and what Wikinights had done had they had created a bunch of supplementary materials and guides and practice problems. And I then know that me and a bunch of other friends would use this to study for our exams. So I know that without this OER that existed outside of our course, which um, uh, the professor did uh, mention and implement and leave a link to so that people could study with it. Um, I know that because of these OER materials, I was able to get better scores on my exams than some of my friends. <laughs> Very nice. So definitely making it more of a collaborative effort to support each other's performance versus you're just uh, you're on your own trying to trying to figure out what you're supposed to be doing. That's great. And that sounds like the teacher definitely supported that. Excellent. OK, well, this kind of touches on the next question that we were going to move to. So there was an earlier session today about open pedagogy. And so now we're talking beyond just using an open educational resource, but now um, the idea of, of students having more of and uh, taking more action and actually creating knowledge and creating um, artifacts. So um, I think Carson, your, uh, your example is, is one of those, um, but has anyone else experienced um, kind of a, a teacher-driven example in a course where you were asked to participate in open education, maybe creating a resource that then gets shared widely, et cetera. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll jump in on that. Um, I wouldn't say it was necessarily uh, started by the professor, but um, he definitely got on board as second as we brought it up. So I used to be, a, well, I still am, but I used to be a TA 
um, a couple of years ago. And students would always come into my office hours and they would ask for like practice problems, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I, it, this was for uh, intro to C programming, which is not, uh, if you're maybe not familiar, C is a very old language. So there's many different ways to explain it. And that can be pretty confusing. So people asked, where can I find examples? And it's kind of hard to point because there are so many and they're very old. Um, so me and another TA, we just kind of started making them um, mm. ourselves. And we make like little weekly uh, review sessions with all these practice problems and things like that. Um, and, and by far, our students have, you know, always come back and said, you know, this was you know really helpful. This was awesome. So the um, professor was on board with us, you know, making these extra resources and um it may or may not have led to uh that being brought under a, a much larger project that Carson was was kind of alluding to but that really just started because students needed more practice and uh you know we were able to to make that just when we could it was pretty helpful to students I think that's fantastic I mean that that is one of the goals of open education is to be swift be able to detect if there's a problem, if there's a gap in some kind of learning, what can we do quickly <laughs> to grab all the knowledge that's out there, curate it, and put it in front of the person that really needs it? That's a, that's a great example. All right. Uh, here is a really general one. So anybody can jump in. How has open education benefited you personally? It's, it's kind of an open-ended one. I mean, I'll, I suppose I'll jump in again. Um, so I, I know this one might seem a little bit trivial, but I, I still want to put it forward. Um, open education has benefited me because um, having, you know, educational resources that are just out there is very fun for my own personal learning, right? Uh, you know, there are several different fields of physics. And sometimes when you're taking a class or when you just want to know for your own personal information, it's very useful to have those resources out there. You know, something that you can just look back on when you need additional context for something else. Um, and of course, I've already shared my experience uh, in just a physics course that I was required to take, but there are many others that I've had personally. I love this question and it kind of like goes into like a twofold answer for me. So last year I took a humanities course and the professor that I had had a certified affordable course, that little stamp that UCF has like on their web courses when you know like there's a class that doesn't require um, yes. any extra or additional purchases um, in addition to being registered in this class. And I didn't know that when signing up for the class, but it was to my surprise. And honestly, it just changed the course for me in such dramatic ways in the best way possible because I got to see the passion that my professor had for humanities and telling this story. Her course was themed around like monsters, mad scientists, and like looking at <laughs> old texts. And of course, all these old texts, you know, have old English in them. And so she was showing us like all these like translated versions. There's all open educational resources. And I, like I was saying earlier, how it kind of streamlines the academic experience is because the professor doesn't have to go out of her way to, you know, draw these lines from a textbook to this story that she's trying to weave in her class. And so being able to incorporate all of those, just, you could just tell how, you know, passionate she was, like, and it made me so much more excited to go to class and, and get to see what she was, um, you know, going to lecture about that day. And I, you know, just responded so well that I ended up changing my minor to pre-law oh. in humanities because I just loved it so much and I really loved you know that connection so that's why it's twofold it was just it bettered my classroom experience my learning experience and it also kind of like inspired another step that I wanted to take in my academic journey that's incredible that is so incredible that this person's kind of commitment to her personal story and passion and expertise has had such an effect that it's actually you know affected someone's career or future <laughs> it's amazing uh, and that sounds cool actually I want to take that course that you're talking about so it's it infectious so whatever awesome that <laughs> it was so cool she's just awesome <laughs> well uh, yeah I mean this reminds me of some of the English professors that I work with that have curated uh, again back to the curation um 
for instance, I, I know Lucy, we were at the same event that one of the, the people that were recognized at the event was in English and he's a expert in medieval literature and there's so much out there and a lot of it is public domain. But that's kind of also the downside. There's so much out there. And so uh, usually people will purchase these anthologies that have some public domain, some others, fairly costly anthologies, and you end up not using all of the things in the anthologies. So then again, it kind of like mur makes the experience murky, like you're talking about. So um, I, I've worked with a couple of English professors that have selected the exact readings, the exact poems, the exact images that they wanted to use, curate them into a collection. And then it really does, it helps focus everyone's attention and it does really bring out that person's persona as well. So that's great. Good luck. Good luck to you, Lucy. <laughs> All right. So we've been, we've talked about some of the great the, the opportunities and the possibilities and the great things, but let's, let's, be realistic. There must be some challenges with open education too. Have you ever ran into any challenges with uh, open education, either a resource that may have been adopted or um, maybe information not being correct? Or is there any, any kind of uh, experiences so far? I just had a quick note and then any of you guys can take over. I'm sure you have awesome, you know, experience and great stuff on that from Wiki Nights. But something I wanted to know, kind of going away from the question, but on topic, is that I feel like there's a common misconception when people talk about like open educational resources that if it's free, that it's not as high quality. And that can be a challenge in and of itself is that people have that notion but I argue all the time that it's the complete opposite. You know, just because it is free doesn't mean we're lessening the quality. Um, if anything, it could be enhancing it. And I think that when you have, you know, professors and people who work really hard on these resources, it you find that it does come out in a really beneficial way. And like I've been saying, I feel like I'm a broken record, but it, <laughs> Or so much more cohesive when it's when you're talking about what the professor is lecturing compared to like what we're doing outside the classroom or studying anything like that yeah so you're saying the challenge is uh kind of the perception of if it's free it it must not be of, of the same quality as something that you would pay for yeah and, and it's funny because uh the the stories that i've heard about student reactions when they hear that it's something is free is so positive <laughs> you know I think they I don't I don't know if students are questioning the quality too much like maybe that's there but I think the appreciation for for something being completely accessible from day one at no cost is like you got me you know you sold me on day one does anyone else have anything to add about the the challenges of OER. Like, for instance, Jerry, you mentioned the the teaching assistant thing, where you were uh, then kind of took it on to maybe curate some resources and the question sets and all of that. Does can, can you talk about some of the challenges that you had in doing that? Yeah, I can definitely. Um, I was actually going to say something and then you already started me off. So it's <laughs> um, yeah, I think that um, it gets more challenging, especially when you get to more niche topics, um, because there's less out yeah. there, or, or it might be harder to find um, exactly what you're looking for. So uh, oftentimes, me and the other TA for that class kind of just had to make it up as we went, um, because, I mean, I'll, I'll just go with that example, is that uh, it's a maybe 40, 50-year-old programming language. There's going to be so many different uh, understandings and way to use that. Uh, people have changed the way they teach it over the years. So sometimes it's very hard to find what you're looking for, um, even in other courses as well. Um, I'm TAing for a different course actually this semester, computer architecture, um, where the one of the first classes you take in the degree. And that one I've actually had a very hard time finding those resources in the same way, just because it's maybe a slightly more niche topic. So those I've really had to come up from scratch for. Um, but yeah, it's definitely uh, something that I've had to work with as I've 
uh, you know, continue working with open education and, and just these resources in general. For sure. Right. Right. That's a great point. I know we're, we're, or most of us are familiar with uh, entities like OpenStax that has access to introductory material and that's fantastic. And we all understand why that would be the, um, the emphasis with the number of students. But I, I've also noticed that working with teachers, especially in graduate studies that say, well, there's nothing in my discipline. And that's usually not 100% true, but it usually does point to having to work a little bit harder. Sometimes it's been a matter of actually working through the library and seeing what library resource materials are out there. Not exactly OER, but at, at no additional cost to the student. So sometimes we, you know, hey, have to finesse a little bit, but like what you said, you had to actually, you know, you made stuff up. <laughs> you didn't, you didn't pretend, but I mean, you actually sat down and you, and you did it. And I think that that sometimes is absolutely, you know, you're creating knowledge and sharing that knowledge out. That's, that's what open education is all about. I'll add yeah. uh, just real quick. You mentioned the graduate studies. I, as a graduate student myself, I have noticed the stark absence of any resources once you get to that level. Mm. And most often than not, um, I know Josh is is getting interested in graduate studies as well. Um, is most often I just have to go to the research papers themselves. There's just nothing else anymore. Um, at that point, and I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but I, I know that's definitely something I've noticed as well. Interesting. All right. So that's that is definitely a gap in the open education world. All oh. right. Yes. Oh Joshua, yeah. Did you have gonna... something to add? Sure. Oh yeah, I was just going to add a, a quick few things, mostly just building sure. off of what was Jared, Jared was talking about. Uh, one of the things uh, is Jared is completely right here when he says research papers is a lot of the educational resources that you'll have to go through. Because when I've looked at books from the library about a specific subject, a lot of them, like the chapters, are actually just like very important research fields in that paper. So, you know, there's definitely that aspect to it. And I also just want to mention, even when we as Wikinites, you know, we're looking for alternatives. Sometimes we will come across a roadblock, right? We'll try to look for um, a textbook that, you know, is open and that matches almost one-to-one -one as far as like the contents that it covers. And sometimes that's just not possible, which is really unfortunate. Um, usually an act we'll do is we'll have to kind of combine sort of, I don't want to say Frankenstein because that gives you a <laughs> negative connotation. We'll sort of have to combine different OER uh, textbooks and resources out there and try and make them more complete. Uh, resource for students and faculty, of course. Right, that definitely adds another element. When, um, for instance, kind of similar to what you're saying, there have been teacher. There was a uh, two anthropology teachers that created an OER for their introductory to anthropology course. This is a huge, huge undertaking. So the first thing they did, which makes sense, is look for existing OER that's out there, and they ran into a couple of things that were OER, technically, and they were just a bit outdated. You know, the research changes, the way people talk, use language changes, and they were like, this, this isn't going to work. <laughs> and so you, you have to be discerning with the, the open uh, resources that are out there, and you may have to use a little bit of this, a little bit of that. That takes some extra time and effort, but I would, I'm sure, Joshua, you would agree that, that, that it is worth the time and effort when it comes to getting the information in front of people at no cost. All right, let's move on to recommendations to teachers. So there are, I am assuming in this list of participants that are watching, there are some teaching faculty here. So let's say we have a teaching faculty that's interested, not quite sure where to start. What, what's one recommendation you would give to a, a teacher on, on kind of dipping their toe in the open education world. I'm trying to see if I had, if I was going to ask someone. No, I, I didn't. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry for just okay. kind of just rushing in. Oh, uh, go for it. You know, but one of the things I would recommend is, you know, we have several resources here at UCF, and I'm sure there are many other resources at uh, different universities. Um, I know it's a saying, but it is for a reason. Check your local library. 
legitimately because <laughs> the library has so many resources at their disposal, whether that's textbooks, whether that's various other educational resources, there is almost certainly someone on staff who will at least know where to point you in the right direction, right? The Because the first step is always just knowing that OER does exist. You don't have to use a paid textbook. That's not the only option. Once you understand that, and once you understand that there's people to help you along, that's that's just the first step, right? That, if I could make one suggestion, because I know probably other people have others, so I'll just you know stop there. But yeah, does anyone else want to chime in for a recommendation? Um, yeah, I could chime in here. Um, so. I think um, what um, Josh and Jared and I have, have noticed through our um, program of trying to map uh, paid textbooks to open educational resources, I think that one of the things we've noticed the most is that most of the time, if you just search for them, they're just they're just out there. I know um, some resources <laughs> that we love really are OpenStax, of course, which we've mentioned a few times before. Um, a great resource has tons of different textbooks for tons of different classes, especially um, like general education classes. Um, I also know that there, we use um, LibreText, which is a, a similar thing. It has a combination of OER resources. Um, but I think my greatest tip to any faculty that would be interested in getting into using OER would be to just type it into Google and see what happens. Um, <laughs> we have more right. success than you think. <laughs> I can solve so many things. Just type it into Google. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. I mean, that kind of really is the point that you need you can start somewhere even just exploring what's out there already and if there isn't something out there that you are really feeling great about you can create it yourself you can adapt it you can you know all of these options you don't have to just adopt outright what what's out there at a cost that's great advice all right so let's turn now to a little bit more about this group called the Wiki Knights, which also y'all got a shout out earlier. I just wanted to mention that in uh, there was a there was a session earlier about inclusive access and the first day program and those types of things. And uh, it was mentioned in that that at UCF we have an opt in model to uh, first day and inclusive access digital materials. And, and uh, one of the reasons we have that is because there was, a, there was a lot of voices saying, we don't want to go another route. We don't want to uh, be forced to basically have to opt out of, of materials. And so I know that this group has been around a while and I would love to know more details about how it, how it came together. So Jarrett, maybe you could, you could start us off with how did this group come together and what are what's your main goal? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I can't speak for quite when it first started. I joined the second semester after, but I, I have a pretty good idea of how uh, it was originally created. Um, the, the person who started the club, John Martinus, um, he was a really fun guy, really passionate. Um, he was a, a political science major, I believe, um, switched from computer science. and But, but then all that aside, I think he uh, just fell in love with the idea of using these open resources in the name Wiki Nights. The original purpose of the club was to just edit Wikipedia pages. We were going to, you know, like, you know, just cover the web and, you know, try to make all these resources. And we were going to, like, take over all the textbooks and just replace them all with the Wiki Nights version. And, you know, it was this <laughs> grand idea, this grand plan. Um, I think as, uh, you know, we've matured a little bit as a group, I don't think that's maybe quite, uh, you know, maybe as possible. Um, it takes a couple more hands than just a, a couple of students with some free time. <laughs> right. um, but I, I think uh, he, he started, he was very passionate about it. And um, I have, you know, moved on past that. And, uh, you know, when I was in leadership, kind of did a lot of things with the club as well and, you know, brought in the, the computer science aspect. Um, it is my background, so uh, that brought in a lot of people that were interested in that, and um, everything else involved, I think, has just been building off of those ideas, those initial ideas, and, you know, really seeing how we can uh, best apply that, I guess. And uh, Joshua, how how has the group been able to accomplish its, its goals lately? And, and as Jarrett said, goals change over time. 
but, you know, in the last year or so, what would you say some of the goals or activities that you've been involved in? Uh, I'd love to. So I think, uh, as Jared mentioned, in the beginning, it sort of started as we should make all of these OER materials and distribute them. Um, but I think as we sort of evolved, uh, you know, we can test sort of evolved more of an advocacy goal. Not only because, you know, uh, like Jared mentioned, there are only so many hands that you can have, like working on uh, specific textbooks, but also just because, uh, you know, as we've discussed, there are so many out there. I uh, want to do just a quick plug. Um, OERcommons.org uh, dot, dot is a great place to start searching as well, in addition to Google. But, um, you know, uh, so what we do typically is we want to get the word out. Like I mentioned, that's the first step. And so that's getting the word out to students as well as faculty. And the ways we do that are multifaceted, right? We have meetings, uh, we go and table outside the student union. Uh, and of course, tabling serves the double purpose of not only letting people know that, you know, OER exists, these alternatives are great, but also to just ask students like, hey, how are these paid textbooks, um, you know, affecting you? And what would, and you know, would you like OER resources for OER resources, OER as an alternative? And overwhelmingly, of course, the answer is like, is yes, that is what uh, we prefer. Because I don't think, I think we briefly kind of touched on this, but students really understand when their uh, professors care for them. And OER is like something where it really shows that like the faculty is really not only worried about like themselves, but about like the cost to students, right? When it is feasible, obviously, right? But, you know, that's all to say, uh, we continue to advocate for it both by, uh, you know, posting on social media, uh, talking to people, you know, just one on one. Uh, as Jarrett mentioned, you know, uh, he created the CS materials and the intro to C materials. We continue to work on those to that this day. Uh, for some context, UCF is a very specific science exam, which is very difficult. So we try to have those resources out there. It's very important to us that we work on those. Um, but yeah, that's just a brief overview of kind of what we do and like some of the goals that we have and how we accomplish them. Uh, yeah, I think I'll just stop there. Okay. <laughs> I have something interesting to add. Jared, I'm so glad you brought up John. So John's sister Moira goes to UCF and she's actually our director of communications on cabinet. And so crazy everyone always says UCF largest university in the state of Florida one of the largest in the nation but it's a small world around here so I was talking about it at our cabinet meeting this Monday and she goes hey my brother literally started wiki nights and I was like it's crazy, it's crazy. <laughs> brother and sister so superstars right there <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's, that's great really cool. so when um when the talk there was the talk of of UCF moving to a model, which is an, an opt out model in which students would have to act, literally opt out of purchasing digital materials. Um, how did Wiki Nights kind of uh, uh, campaign and how, how did you get your voice across to such, you know, high, high leadership at the university? Yeah, I'll uh, speak on that. I, I was there for uh you know, next to to John, as he uh, really led that whole campaign, I know he was really nervous at first because this was a kind of a big undertaking and I don't think he quite knew what he was getting into. Um, but I think once we started to kind of explain to students what the differences between these models were, I think overwhelmingly uh, the natural student voice kind of presented itself as uh, I would rather have the option to choose for this textbook um, than to be maybe forcefully given the option. Um, the, the Something we've always seen is that students maybe don't always check their emails or are familiar with what's going on on campus. And I, I say that for, for everything on campus, it's very big and there's so many services we have. And uh, yes. oftentimes, People have no idea that we have stuff. I'll bring it up all the time. Like, oh, I had no idea we had that. Um, so I think uh, when we we kind of brought this up to students, I think it was it was a natural uh, response that they would rather have the option to choose it, even if the the textbooks are maybe very good um, and very good quality. I think uh, you know students. Uh, 
to be a little bit blunt, I mean, they're not dumb necessarily, you know, I mean, we're all here to learn. And I think uh, uh, students generally uh, want the best for them. And, you know, they're, they're coming to this university and uh, they, they just want to have options. They want to have the choices. Right. And I think that was really what was important. And the rest of itself kind of just carried itself away, I think, at that point. <laughs> right. Right. It all comes down to having choices. So, Jared, what would what would you suggest for let Let's say there's a uh, someone watching right now that's uh, a different institution completely, ha and they don't have any kind of student advocacy group at at their campus. What, what do you suggest would be a good place to start? This is a very good question. Um, I think that the best place is I know I'm not sure about every institution, but I'm sure it, in most there is some form of a student government or an SGA in some sort. Uh, we've worked with student government in the past, and I think um, our, as Wiki Nights, our work and connecting with student government actually helped us in some of these discussions because they have, um, they have a role, you know, a more official stance on campus to represent their students and then the voice of students. So I think, um, you know, us, because we're, you know, maybe some no-name club some couple of years ago, and I think that uh, student government, they have those connections and regularly, you know, so they'll have those connections with uh, whoever can, you know, best make decisions for students. And I think uh, connecting with some form of student government or student leadership is really the, the best way to start. Yes, Lucy, do you want to add anything to that with your, you are a, a part of SGA? I mean, yeah, for sure. I think Again, like something that's super special and what I love about what I do in my position, I'm academic affairs coordinator. So this is perfectly right in my line of work, if you will. Um, and even when, you know, talking about OER and aim of the first, you know, student group that pops up is Wiki Nights. So Jared is so, you know, correct in that in saying that student government, you know, they have some form of it on any campus. And those are the groups of people that, you know, want to bring change. And this is a super tangible way that we can change a lot of student lives. And so bringing it to the attention of student government agents is so important because we always say at the end of the day, like, we're here to serve students, like, we're here to rep like represent and advocate for what they care about. And so bringing concerns to us is the first step because we have the connections and the people to connect you to and you know it's so exciting and I'm I've loved getting to share this stage with you guys and being able to help raise awareness for what y'all do and like give them a platform because this is so important and I hope that you know every campus has a version of this because their work is so important and happy to support it. Yes, I think that it's definitely the, the uh, it, it's about getting in front of the people that are making the decisions and student government is literally the advising body for uh, those people. So that's a great place to start. All right. Well, we've got seven minutes left and this seems like a perfect amount of time to open the floor for people that have been uh hearing us discuss all of these questions and answers and issues. If there are any burning questions out there, feel free to post in the text chat or uh, feel free to just jump in there with, with your voice. This is that awkward period where you like, please, Somebody have a question for for students. <laughs> Guys, we're just so thorough yeah. that <laughs> we did go. Yeah, we did talk about the questions that we we wanted to cover. So I do think we did a pretty thorough job <laughs> at explaining why open ed education is important. What are some of the challenges? What are some of the benefits? What what are all the actions that took place? Uh, oh, I see a, a hand up. Thank you so much, Lily Dubach. And then Amanda, too. You can chime in after. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing your experiences and um, 
I think I've met most of you before being the textbook affordability librarian at UCF, but I have a question. So you're all so passionate about this, so interested in it. As you talk to other students around campus, obviously they're impacted by textbook costs and other things, but do they really kind of get invested in knowing more about OER or open education? Or do you get a sense that there's there's a large group of students who are just like, eh, I don't care. I'm just, you know, not gonna buy this. I mean, what what's your sense of the percentage of, of interest in the actual topic? I'll answer this one kind of briefly. And, and, and you know, I, I feel like, you know, Carson or Jared might disagree and that's perfectly fine. I think there's sort of like a, a spectrum, you know. Um, when we talk about open education and open educational resources and putting them in classrooms, throughout my entire experience with the there's been one person who has ever said, I, I don't want open educational resources, right? So I think in that sense, you know, people are vaguely invested. People vaguely would like open educational resources. And, you know, people are like, good job, support the work. I think that's great. Now, as for people who actually kind of want to join Wikinice or want to advocate for it or want to do something with it, that's a different question. And, and you know, obviously it's hard because there's only so many people, even with tabling, even with going to, you know, RSO events that we can reach. But I'd say a good portion do. It's hard to give a hard percentage number. I'd say, uh, that, that, again, it's so difficult because it even depends on which event we go to. But, you know, uh, of course, Jared, Carson, feel free to chime in. Maybe you're like, Josh, that's completely wrong in my experience. But, you know, in my experience, that has been the case. I hope that was an adequate answer, but. Yeah, I'll add a little bit. Um, I think that it, it is kind of hard to, to get an idea of the whole student body, um, just based on our small uh, conversations. But I think that uh, there are a lot of students that are just going to go, yep, that's the cost. Great. I'll just do it, whatever it is. Um, and I'll see students that will. Uh, we always, students always tell each other, don't buy the textbook before you even got to the class. You don't even know what you're getting into yet. Um, and, and people will, yep, yep, whatever it is, I'll okay, get, get it, whatever it is. Um, and I think that there is kind of that attitude that whatever it is, they will just jump towards that without really uh, maybe paying too much attention to it. It seems like the easiest path. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that maybe students don't realize that there are other options. It's just whatever my professor tells me to do, that's it, that's the answer. Mm -hmm. So I think that comes, that kind of like mentality Josh was talking about kind of comes from that, I think a little bit too. All right, we have time for one last question and it comes in the chat. So the question is, we're talking about OER in education, but do you see yourself using it in the workplace for an internship? That's such a good question. I mean, I'll say something really quick, a thousand percent. I mean, in we all come from very, like very different physics and like computer science and like mine is like more pre-law. It perfectly aligns with what I'm doing because it's so important to have access to resources. Um, and I'm always saying that like, you know, as we like progress with technology, things like, you know, having readily available access to, you know, things like of literature nature is going to be so regular i think censorship and licensing it's all it's, it's all changing every day and i think that it's so important to a like have exposure to it you know while we're in you know college and we have like you know people in figures in place to kind of help that journey but also learn how to you know curate it and seek it out ourselves um and you know whenever I you know get we have like a mentorship program within student government and whenever I meet with my mentee I'm always talking about you know different things that we're finding and helping her with her classes because she's in like GEP classes so it's like going being able to like give that back I think is going to make the difference and it's also going to bring I'll always bring that with me you know whether in you know academics or in a professional realm Mm, that's a great answer. You're you're applying applying kind of a general skill that we know is going to be more and more necessary into the future. That's great. All right. Well, 
We're at 449. So we just wanted to thank these four students again, Jarrett, Joshua, Carson, and Lucy. Thank you so much for taking your time today and sharing some of your experiences and your perspectives. We really appreciate that. And I also want to thank all the audience members who also took their time to participate today. I see some clapping and a lot of thank yous. Um, as I said, we're, we're very appreciative of your work.